Hi, I'm Ian Vasey, the President and CEO of Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation. Welcome to a project that we're calling Our Coastal Bend. It's a way that we're working to understand and improve the quality of life and the quality of place in our community. 2020 changed the world. They turned the world upside down. Supply chains were significantly disrupted. Um, people were working from home. They, they accelerated the way that uh, people work. A lot of talented professionals figured out that they could live anywhere they want and still get their jobs done. In economic development, it's not always about creating the jobs and attracting the jobs to a community. Sometimes you really have to focus on building the most attractive community you can so that talented professionals and families can, will choose where to live and they're gonna relocate themselves. So we have to make ourselves attractive and we have to understand where some of our faults are and some of the things that we need to improve. Again, it's all part of building that quality of place and making this the Coastal Bend an attractive place to live. Well, hello everyone. I am Dr. Katherine Laughlin. Uh, I am the one who sort of brought place attachment research into empiricism. So we could actually start studying some of those things that Ian is just talking about. I have to reiterate everything he just said. It's very true. We now understand the role of place at the economic development table like never before, because when you remove the job, then it all becomes about the place. And 2020 taught us, you know, sometimes we, we work where we are and that has really changed the game. So this research that, that we have conducted and will continue to implement findings from could not be better well-timed for your community. And I'm very glad to have been a part of this project. So first out, what I wanted to do was share sort of the executive summary version of what we found. And then if you'd like to stick around, and I hope you do, we'll talk a little more in depth about some of these findings and then continue on about what this means for implementation and moving forward. So just to remind everyone, the purpose of our study really was to measure community attachment in the Coastal Bend region. We're going to talk a little more about what that means. So where are people in feeling attached to the area? Um, what are the demographic differences in attachment? We were able to unpack some of that information and then to identify the things about the place, the region, that really seem to be um, driving those feelings of attachment. So attachment is only useful if you know what it is about your place that really seems to be heightening those feelings or that you could be doing better to really push people to love where they live in your area even more. And then on top of that, really graph for you a work plan for moving forward. What are the things you're getting right? And what are the things that are challenge areas that we can focus on in the next phase of this project to enable you to put these findings to work? This is applied research. This isn't sitting on a shelf research. And again, the timing could not be better for your region to have this data. So our methodology in this survey is really based on my previous work with the Soul of the Community Project, which was a 26 city, three year research project where we looked at what made people love where they lived and why it mattered. We followed a similar trajectory in this, in this project um, that I've also done in Canada, uh, other places in the US and some places in Europe and Australia as well. So what I, we are able to bring to you is a methodology as well as measurement instruments that we know actually measure what we think they're measuring. This is not exploratory. Although I will sneak peek to you now that some of your findings are very different from what we have found anywhere else really in the world. We used an online survey that I hope many of you all participated in based on that instrument that I have always used. And we deployed convenient sampling, which means we encouraged everyone to come and take the survey so we could get a representative sample of the region and I have to commend the community for coming out on this. We were able to not only achieve the sample we needed statistically very early on in our data collection, but actually was able to push valid sample past 1200. So very happy with that. The first thing I wanna share with you is generally where is the attachment playing out in the region? So do keep in mind, this is the coastal bend region. 
What I see when I look at this graph is that for the most part, we have pretty good levels of attachment of the high, even the highest levels of attachment in the community. However, your opportunity is in these folks that what I would call fence sitters. People who, yeah, kind of like it, but could like it a little bit more. These people are the ones that I would most direct you towards to tip. You know, tipping point is a real thing, even in community attachment. How can we tip that 46% into that high attachment category? The low attachment folks, you know, this is always a decision that communities have to face themselves, which is, do we try to tip people who we're kind of close to getting, or do we go hard for the folks that as soon as they get the chance, they're probably going to bolt and leave the community if they have the economic means to do so. Most communities choose that medium category. And luckily for us, it is your most prevalent category. And by doing so, you might actually migrate some of the lowly attached folks who are really not feeling it right now into that medium attachment category. So let's look at, again, this is the executive summary. So if you want more information, I do encourage you to stay tuned. We're gonna get in more detail. What we also try to provide, as I said at the beginning, is a work map, you know, a blueprint for action. This is very important to this particular research. So we created empirically. So this isn't us putting the dots on the page. This is where the data is moving in these various areas. What you see before you is a grid that basically outlines the strengths and the weaknesses of the coastal bend region as it relates to community attachment. So the strength category would be the things that matter to attaching people to the area and you seem to be performing highly at. The things in the weaknesses area are the things that matter for attachment but aren't rated as highly by your residents. Now, the first thing that happened to me when I saw this grid is I thought, wow, that's really different than what I'm used to seeing, primarily in one area in particular, and that is social offerings and social capital. Look at where those two things are on the screen. So social capital, which is what we measure as the individual networks people have within the community and how much time they spend with those individual networks. This social capital was up here and social offerings, which is you can think of as the more macro, you know, the ability to do social things in the community, having a social infrastructure that people enjoy. That had switched places. So usually I see social capital where social offerings is, and social offerings were social capital. They had completely switched. Now, of course, the first thing that came to my mind is that this is a COVID effect, that in a time where communities are not able to access infrastructure socially, we being human beings that are social and will never stop being social, no matter what's going on, we will find a way to work around that we will find our individual connection points and really exploit those if we can in the community. And that gives us a sense of well-being, a sense of attachment to the community. So the strengths were really the aesthetics, the social capital, and feelings of, you know, a lot of people could make a home for themselves here, regardless of age, race, background, et cetera. Another thing that really seemed to matter, which is an unusual finding, was the presence of basic services as mattering for attachment at all. Usually basic services lives down here somewhere. Again, my tendency is to think that this is a COVID effect, that people are now relying more on our healthcare systems, on our broadband, on the hope that we have clean water, that the highways and, and, the, and the basic running of the community is going well because we're feeling a little disoriented. Things are way different than they used to be. So people are sort of saying, hmm, I wish I could get more satisfaction, more senses of, of well-being from these other issues, these other components of the community that I'm relying more on. But I wasn't completely happy with my own interpretations of this. So what I decided to do was kind of unlock these categories. Um, these categories, social offerings, aesthetics, basic services, again, 
were carried from the Soul of the Community project. So times are different. This is unprecedented. If I hear that one more time, right, we're all going to lose it. But it truly is. So what would happen if I sort of released the locks behind these categories and dug deeper? And I want to show you what I found. So when I drilled down and released these categories, working with our U of M partners, which were fantastic in this, I was able to see really what's going on here. And what's going on here is these categories are kind of reorganizing themselves a little bit empirically so that our strength in the community is really not just about social capital and aesthetics. It's about if this is a good place for families and children. This is a good place for seniors. It's got a great beach and people are generally pretty cool to each other in those environments, which is important. Um, the things that there were that were important for attachment that we weren't doing as well on is what I would call that young talent uh, component where there's social offerings, there's recreation, it's, it's seen as a good place for young people. It's a great place to meet new people. That's sort of my young talent in a nutshell, new category, if you will. And also the government system sort of aligned with the education system as the parent of a 13 year old who is um, schooling online upstairs as we speak, again, in our minds, our government services, our basic services are now seeming to wed a little bit more with education systems. Historically, they have stayed pretty separate empirically. So that was what we were starting to understand. Now, if you've made it through this far, I would continue to, to to stick with me because there are more data points and more findings that I think you'll find interesting. Now again, these are what we discussed in the executive session. So if you need to go back and refer to that, but basically we're trying to measure community attachment in all the ways that it can manifest itself in your community and what's driving it. We did these online survey until we reached a convenient sample, which in your case was well, well was over 1200 valid cases. Now this is something I didn't talk about in the executive summary, which is a step back to say, now what is this thing? What are we looking at and why do we care? So basically the community attachment model is a process by which we identify the attributes of a community. What are the things about a place that seem to drive residents' emotional bonding, their emotional, what we would call dropping roots down into a place that correspond to better outcomes for both the community and individual level. So one of the things we typically study in community attachment is, well, how attached is everybody? So there's the heart. What drives those feelings about the place? And if they have, as attachment grows, what does that get you? Is it something tangible? Is it something you can uh, look to as important? And what we discovered again in the Night Soul of the Community Project, as well as in Canada and Australia and Europe and other places in the US, um, when you have higher levels of attachment, individuals and communities seem to do better in very hard outcomes. Hard outcomes being GDP growth not GDP, this isn't rich places feeling good about being rich places, but actual measure of economic growth. We also see individual level impacts that are quite remarkable, such as less school dropout, elderly populations who are more likely to be more fit and able to seek and receive medical attention. They don't isolate in their, in their homes. And lots of other things, home ownership, um, starting your own business, all those things seem to be happening when people more and more feel this level of attachment. So we care about this a great deal. I mean, this is really the heart of what we're doing, but we can only care about it if we know what drives it. So that in a nutshell is really why we're focusing on community attachment as opposed to other things. Now, one other thing I will mention before I move off this slide, this is a relatively new concept. I mean, I've been working in this world about 13, 14 years. And at the beginning, you know, soul of the community really helped to establish why this stuff is so important. We didn't even know. We were just trying to explore, do places still matter? And if they do, how do they mat matter in any meaningful way? 
and how do we make um, place and person better, better aligned because it was funded by a place-based foundation who obviously cares about place. So the other thing I will mention that's important is unlike other things we study in, in communities, community attachment is very easy to optimize. Well, let me explain what I mean. I mean that if you can change public perception, and it is public perception, of any of the key things that matter to community attachment, you will see within 12 to 24 months differences in attachment. At least the next time I measure it, I saw differences. So it really moves together and it moves together pretty quickly. So let's look a little bit more at your findings. Now, the first thing I'll share with you that I didn't share previously, but I do think it's important is what were the aspects of attachment? So below you see the questions we asked in trying to gauge levels of attachment. First thing you'll notice is we didn't ask, how attached are you to the, to the coastal Bend region? What we know is that attachment is multidimensional. There are lots of things that create this idea of attachment and it's way beyond satisfaction. So I show you this just so you can see the things about attachment that seem to be particularly highly rated, you know, what aspects of attachment are you really getting right and how much they seem to matter for overall attachment. So let me explain. First of all, let's look at the ratings. Up, up at the top where it says overall attachment score, one to four, you can see that the overall attachment score of our sample was 2.92. 18 to 34 year olds, our younger folks, weren't that far off. I've seen a huge difference way beyond that, usually when we divide the whole population and then pull out the young people. So that was promising, but there's clearly a difference. When you look down, and I've highlighted to help us see this a little bit better, what is the thing within attachment that people rate the highest overall? It's pride. People, among all the other things we measured about attachment, there is a leading sense of pride in the area when you look at the entire sample. Now, when you pull out the 18 to 34 year olds, this actually is, is quite um, promising to me. The 18 to 34 year olds have a sense of optimism more than anything else about the future. It is their optimism that is the leading part of their attachment. This is something to easily build on and very exciting because when young people are saying, you know, I think there's something coming here. That is a very powerful aspect of attachment to mobilize. Now, what do these things matter towards attachment itself? So I'll pull you to correlations. I know everybody's favorite statistical lesson, but correlations basically have to do with how much are these two things aligned together? So if you look at your correlations, the thing that is mostly correlated to, and it's a very close tie, so I highlighted both, in the, in the entire sample is recommend, recommending the place and agreeing that it, you're proud to live there. So what does that mean? That means in general, the pride is important and you're doing well on it, okay? There are other things that are also important like your ability to recommend this to other people, this place to other people. I wouldn't go too much over the edge over that because what I have learned after many years in many cities of studying this is that Sometimes when people love a place, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to recommend it. They don't want everybody showing up and ruining their good time. So I wouldn't worry as much about that, but I would focus on understanding that your pride in place is something to leverage when you look at everyone. Now, when you look at your young people, what story do they tell? A very similar one. They really need that sense of pride in place to fuel their attachment. They need, need to be proud. They need to want to invite their friends to come see them there, their family, whatever the case may be. They wanna look around and sort of feel good about what they're seeing. So pride, again, continues to be very important in leveraging young people's optimism about the future. So let's move on. Again, 
This is something to keep in mind because it drives where you'll do your interventions. Again, I still, my recommendation is these fence sitters are where those young people are. Those fence sitters are people who probably have a choice on where to live now more than ever. So tipping them, the timing could not be better. So what drives attachment in the area? Now remember, we talked about this in the executive summary, so I'm not gonna go a lot on this. This was where we initially started. This is the typical soul of the community model in practice, and we saw this weird thing going on with social capital, social offerings, and basic services. I wanted to also show in this case that I also looked at the 18 to 34 year olds only just to make sure that if we just pulled those people out, were we seeing anything different? And we're really not. The social capital and the social offerings is still flip flop from where we usually see it. And basic services is kind of there though not as strongly. So that tells me unpacking these things was the right call. So let's drill down. Remember we did this drill down before. And in this version of the presentation, I went ahead and called these things something. So we could call them something. So the family friendly happy place, it's what we're getting right. The young talent happy place is something we need to get right. We're not getting as right. And the basic services plus, which includes education, um, is another weakness area that we really could be focusing on. If you look at everything below the line, these are things that don't really matter as much for attachment in your region. So, and a lot of people are surprised by that. Um, why doesn't crime matter? Why doesn't walking around matter? Why isn't openness, um, it usually does matter. So again, breaking that out showed a new finding. And it's because you have to realize that what attachment is about is about is what are the things that people love about you that they feel like would be different if they live somewhere else. We all have a certain level of tolerance for crime. We all, no matter where we went, we would understand that we don't make poor decisions about where we walk at night and what we do. So that's not the thing that grinds our gears when it comes to a place, it's these other things. So that's not at all surprising to me to see the safety measures a little bit below the line. And I wouldn't focus as much on that in an attachment-based conversation. I drilled down again with the 18 to 34 year olds to see did this change just for them, and it does not. So the good news here is that you don't have what I usually call a tale of two cities, where the entire samples think in one way and the young people are like, we are so far off. There's alignment here, which means that you could be doing interventions in phase two that might appeal to the young people and not necessarily lose the rest of everybody. None of us want to be in a situation um, where we feel like we're, you know, over accommodating a certain group to the detriment of others. We're not having that here. If you improve it for one, you will improve it for all is the message by showing you that. Now we had a couple of other related findings that um, we wanted to investigate in partnership, trying to figure out what else would you like to know? And some of these were really quite interesting. Now I'm not gonna go over the edge on this, but I wanna show you. If you unpack everything and you just chart each question, you get another similar story to what we're talking about, but a much more chaotic one. And that is the strengths, family, nature, beach, civility, seniors, Things we need to work on, single, nightlife, arts. So it's an unpacked version even more of what I've been showing you previously, just to show where everything falls out into this two by two quadrant. And if you look at 18 to 34 year, 34 year olds only, the same thing holds true. Family, nature, beauty, beach, nightlife, single, blah, 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 again, I show you this to show that there's alignment across the demographics. So you, your job gets, I wouldn't say easier, but at least a little, a little more comprehensive, if you will, as you go forward. Another question that we had that we wanted to explore for you all is differences. And when I say differences, I mean significant differences between Corpus, Corpus Christi proper and the rest of the region. And I've went ahead and I highlighted for you where we would call these statistical differences. So that means there's a statistical difference in perception on these issues. 
first thing I will draw your attention to is there is not a significant difference in attachment. Okay, so when we boil all this up to the main thing we're studying, attachment, there is no significant difference. It, there is a difference in the numbers, but it is not empirically significant. However, if you go underneath the attachment variable and see all the different ways we measured it, you do see some differences in satisfaction and recommending it as a place. Again, take recommending it with a grain of salt. That could be actual and it could be self-preservation. I've seen that happen a lot. There is also a difference in perceptions of it being a, a young talent happy place with non-city folks having a higher perception. So they feel better about the young happy talent place than folks living in Corpus Christi. That's worth paying attention to when you start doing interventions. The first thing we will always do, and, and Joe's gonna lead you all on this, is is it perception or is it reality? Are, is life better outside of Corpus Christi for young talent um, in the rest of the region? That's part of what we need to explore. And feeling like it's a good place for single young talent seems to be driving that as well as, as you look down, the availability of parks and trails. Also, we see a difference in basic service perception where people outside of the city rate a lot of these things higher. Actually everything except a couple, public transportation and colleges and universities. Again, you have to ferret out, is this perception or is this reality only because it matters in how you intervene. You might need to be changing perception or you might need to be building a bigger mousetrap or a different mousetrap, but you have to understand kind of where these differences fall. And down, if you look at the family friendly happy place, again, not a big difference there. So keep those things in the back of your mind. So to understand when you're doing intervention, there is some different perceptions between the region and the, the and Corpus Christi itself. But in the big scheme of things, that being attachment, there really is not. So just a couple of other things. This was something that kept folks up a little bit at night. So we wanted to study it. You're not gonna have, as of the time we took this data, collected this, which was well within COVID, um, people are not bolting. This is really quite amazing. Uh, you have a very large percentage, 75, 76%, who aren't moving out of the coastal bend. Again, the timing could not be better to start working with the folks you have because they're sticking around, whether it's because they're feeling optimistic about the future, whether it's they're making these, they love the civility and the family friendliness, they're waiting, they're ready to love it even more. The question becomes, well, is it just the long-term residents who are driving that? And the good news yet again is that it's not. So even when we took out your long-term residents, so these are people who have lived here less than 20 years, all the way down to less than a year. There is still not this anticipated migration out, again, reinforcing that the time is good for exactly this. The reasons for moving out, um, it, for the, that small minority who says they plan to, it comes down to options outside of the area and the quality of life. I mean, again, the timing couldn't be better. So you see a large, um, a large 22.42% of other, we wanted to figure out uh, what that was. There was lots of talk of retirement. There was talk of, of better, better, you name it, better taxes, um, better job, better school, you know, that sort of thing. But retirement, so there's an opportunity it's not with your young people necessarily, but a good way to get young people to stay put is if we can get grandma and grandpa or mom and dad to want to be here too, because then we feel more together. So retirement is still a young talent intervention in some cases, depending on the age. And then it's interesting, not surprising. The biggest thing missed due to community is, or due to the pandemic and losing community a bit is events. Again, this is where we get the social offerings being gone. And I think when I see this chart, it makes, or this, this cloud, it makes me feel like the social offerings 
is really taking a hit in attachment because it's just not there to access and people are having to go around it, but they do miss it. So the researcher and the attachment person in me wants to take this, take data again in another year or so and see God willing, you know, things getting better with the vaccine and COVID, do we see social offerings again going right back into play as a really important component of attachment? So I hope that this has been somewhat helpful in understanding the data a little more, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, it's, a, it's kind of interesting to me that, that roads didn't rank as high. You hear that a lot here and it just didn't rank as high as I thought, which is, which is great. Um, you know, the downside is it's, it's what I was concerned about with my children. I have three college age children and, you know, uh, having the social offerings that they want and the places to go. Yeah. That's number one. And then number two, you know, the, the trails and the things to go on the weekends to take the family. And those are things that I, I know we, we need to work on. I, I think this is amazing stuff and and i'm ready to get to work on some of it honestly well and and the good news i think is sometimes attachment data comes in and can empirically confirm what you kind of knew was in your belly but once you have data it's easier to kind of quiet down you know the chaos of what's going on in this community and really create a path forward um, based on what we're seeing from your the voices of your own community not by asking them what attaches them to place, but empirically deriving it. Um, so there's a little more uh, quality to the data instead of just saying, well, what do you love about living here? What do you don't love? Because some pe sometimes people don't know. And then when we can empirically derive it through correlations and stuff, you can feel pretty confident that that's what we're picking up on for sure in the data. And, and, and to add to that, you can certainly take out the data points that people continue to chatter about that don't make a lot of difference. And I'm going to use streets as an example. You know, people, I do hear <clears throat> some complaints about the streets, but one of the things I say is look around town at how many streets are being repaired right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're making a massive effort. I mean, I think we're, we're really choosing the wrong things to talk about. And right. this data only proves that for me. So, That's right. That's right. And I would almost argue if, if people... Um, because it doesn't drive their attachment. There's a certain level of tolerance for road situations because they know if we go somewhere else, it's gonna be the same. You know, That's not the thing that is your competitive advantage is your roads, you know, and thank God, right? If that's the best you could offer, um, garbage pickup and roads, you know, we'd be like, geez, what, I mean, what more can we do? So remember what we're, what we are solving towards is attachment. And, and that does make some things become more important and other things fall away. The other thing under basic services, I like when you, you broke it down into the detail a little more, because I always thought, you know, we have this great Texas A&M University Corpus Christi here. And I was worried. I was like, Ooh, that's thrown into public service. But when you broke it out, it was more about, you know, the K through 12 public school was a concern and the university was on the other end of the graph, which was a very positive thing. Absolutely. And I think we've known that, but it's good to see that data break down so that we can say, hey, let's keep doing what we're doing positively over at the university and in these vocational schools. But, you know, we, we need to make some improvements here in public schools, the K through 12, specifically CCISD. Um, there are some schools around Corpus Christi that we know are fantastic, but uh, it's, it's only pointing to more of what we know, but we've only whispered about it rather than being right. able to look at the data and go, look, this is what people are telling you. Exactly. Yeah, I'm excited to be able to share the share it with CCISD. I mean, I have two kids in CCISD and I was went to school in CCISD and I have thought forever that we needed to make some significant changes at the district and I'm excited now that we at least have not just us telling him <laughs> we actually have data to prove it so I think that's right. going to be a, a good way to kind of open the door and get in there and, and invite them into this discussion right for sure and I will say you're not alone everywhere that I've studied it has been usually the universities um, pulling up the education and it's the public schools that is, is, it is a dichotomy of radically different perceptions of those two, of those two entities. So it is important to sort of break it out and see what's going on there. And I've never studied anywhere where it was different. One of the exciting things I heard was the, the 12 to 24 month 
uh, timeline that you talked about, I think is super exciting. We think, I thought of this as more like a decade long sort of project. And if we can get some results in 12 to 24 months, I mean, that feels like very attainable stuff. Right? Let's, make some, let's make some improvements on some of those areas, some of those retirees that you talked about, they might be leaving, you know, keeping some more of those people here, um, 12 to 24 months to get some results back. That's, that's phenomenal. So. And, and, and we saw it year over year with um, attachment and, and in the soul of project. That's when I started saying, oh, my gosh, I mean, this is doable. This is trackable and it's doable. And, and I would go into places where the attachment levels were like significantly higher the next year. And it was during a time where the economy was falling out of places and I would meet the mayor and I would be like, what did you do from? And he'd be like, I couldn't afford to do anything. I didn't do anything. And come to find out. It was the staycation. It was people not being able to afford to go on vacation. They had to look around and places that were at an advantage because they had some cool stuff people didn't know about. It's not that the stuff changed, it's that the perception changed. Sure. And that's why understanding what's behind that is so important. Yeah. Catherine, one of the things I saw from an economic development perspective, it's not always just about the job creation that we, we've talked about, but the place attachment, the, the, the K through 12 educational fail, not failings, it needs for improvement in, in through K through 12 and the improvements that are needed in creating a nightlife scene, um, especially in those 18 to 34 year old folks that are, are saying, look, we need to have more mm -hmm. evening social offerings. And that's mm -hmm. an area that we really haven't focused on from an economic development, a true economic development perspective. We always focus on the jobs and the investments and things like that. But to round out the community, on one end, we need to, to work on the schools. And the other end, we need to work on building that kind of nightlife social factors. So. That's exactly right. And, and, and that's a typical you know, finding because it is the softer sides of place that make people fall in love with them. And when people fall in love with a place or a person or a dog, I mean, you invest differently in Ooh. that person. And that's the thing that we've missed, I think, in economic development conversations is that emotional um, attachment leads to financial choices. That if you don't have that emotional attachment, you're not going to be investing and, and doing things that really indicate a sense of, of investment truly into a person, place, or thing like attachment shows you. It also leads me to start kind of the wheels turning on if we're going to have a um, a nightlife kind of element. We need to start thinking about becoming a 24 seven city. And one of the other things we need to be thinking about is, is our, like as an example, our downtown would be the place that that could evolve. But one of the things, you know, economics 101, the market tells you where the market is. If we start thinking about, okay, let's add 5,000 residential units downtown, all of a sudden the bars and the restaurants will start to pop for those 18 to 34 year old folks. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say 21 to 34 year old <laughs> just, just to make sure we're still legal on that front. Yeah, but, that's but a good idea. If you think about it, the post-college age kids, if they've got a place to live that's, that's urban feel, kind of, um, you know, walkable, they're going to start to say, because they're, they're not going to want to go to, you know, bars and restaurants if they're not, you know, with driving and things like that, but a walkable downtown is one of those critical things that we're going to need to improve on. Yes, and I think you're you're singing Joe's song um, over there. Yeah, that's a, that's a great segue. I mean, because I think this really sets the stage for as we start to look to phase two. So phase two is going to dig in a little bit deeper in terms of the results of the survey data, and you know, we'll be doing a site visit at the end of at the end of February. We're going to start looking at all right, what's perception, what's reality. Uh, because I think a lot of times folks feel a certain way about their community and that may or may not be the case. So we'll start to dig in a little bit on some of that, some of those issues. Um, but we'll really start looking at, you know, what are those recommendations that we can be making to those, some of those assets that, you know, may already be there and just may not be utilized. So the idea of social offerings, you know, people have a tendency to think of like parks. I, I don't think we're, we're coming in with the idea that we're going to create more parks. It's how are those parks being programmed? How are they being used? How can we, you know, and, and yes, not that yes. it's the CCREDC's yes. job to do this, but who, <laughs> who can everyone be partnering with within the community 
to make sure everyone's kind of picking up little pieces of this. So it's leveraging the assets that you have and then looking at some of those things where, you know, those assets might be missing. And, and Ian, I think you said it perfectly, you know, looking at downtown as one of those areas, we know across the country for 18 to 34 year olds, having a, you know, a vibrant downtown core is important and mm -hmm. looking at, you know, what are the opportunities in downtown Corpus Christi and some of the others surrounding that, that, that it's all just downtown Corpus Christi, but some of the surrounding towns as well for, you know, what are those opportunities to help strengthen those communities so that that quality of life remains high. You guys already have oceanfront. That's, that's a huge advantage over numerous communities all over the country. It's leveraging some of the other built environment now to make it, you know, that, to create that higher quality of life. And I would say also keeping in mind, and Joe, and Joe talks about this too, and I'm so glad that's why we partnered on this, is that not having an economic threshold for social offerings all the time. It's very important, like he said, programming. Um, what are we doing? Could, could a young person, a young family, uh, choose their own adventure in your downtown? Is there, you know, what about, how are we t leveraging the beach? How are we, not everything needs to be pay to play because a lot of these kids are still carrying debt. They're not highest on the hog yet necessarily. And so you wanna find ways where not everything has an economic threshold for participation. And unfortunately people think of social offerings, they only think of bars and, and stuff where you guys have the beach and you guys have parks and you have all these other opportunities that lend itself also to programming that allow people to sort of enjoy them in new ways that don't, don't always involve getting out your Apple Pay. Did um, Ian and Chris, did y'all see the article in the paper yesterday where you know the uh, city council approved the budget for the improvement of the Coal Park Pier mm -hmm. and what that rendering is gonna look like? It's pretty impressive. Um, it's- That actually was done through the type B funds through okay. that, that, that are, you know, we help administer for, with with the city right. council. So we work with Peter, and you know that's an important economic development item. And and again, it's one of those visually improved. It, you know, it's a highly visible thing that when people drive down, you know, down ocean, all of a sudden you see a dilapidated pier. But hopefully, we, if the plan comes to fruition and it looks like it will, there's something beautiful there. We, you know. There, there was, there's people in this community who still don't think we deserve nice things. And, and that's, that's a hard challenge. And I think those folks are kind of moving on and aging out. And I think the important, one of the things I've heard Catherine say is, let's get our hooks into the 18 to 34 year old kids before they make the serious money, get them here, get them invested, get the, you know, our hooks into okay. them. And when they make a lot of money, then they're gonna stick with us. Right. That's right. So hello, everybody. Joe Borgstrom. I'm principal of Place and Main Advisors. And I'm working with Catherine Laughlin on uh, this, our Coastal Bend project. And we'll be leading phase two. And phase two is really about kind of building on the findings of phase one, which we learned all about the assessments and, and looking at how we can improve those things within the Coastal Bend region. The way we were going to start this off is we'll start out with a uh, field visit here at the end of February, where we really have four main goals. We, you know, we're looking to get kind of boots on the ground within the region get, to get a better understanding of, you know, the community, how it lays out uh, in terms of also, you know, what the perception that we saw that, that was reflected in the assessment versus the reality of what's there. Looking a little bit at things like infrastructure, road and road conditions, those types of things, but also looking at some of those broader things in terms of the um, social offerings and, and the environment of the downtown and, and of, the, of the coastal area to be able to get a good understanding for how all that works. We also want to be able to use that time to meet with any key leaders. That's important that we're there to meet in person. We'll be doing a lot of, of follow-up meetings virtually and uh, over the phone. And then lastly, you know, we're going to start to form some of those recommendations during this visit. And what I really want to do is make sure that we're getting a good understanding of kind of where all these assets are within the community. We know the coastal Bend region it has a ton of assets from infrastructure to social, but we want to make sure that we're, you know, creating a, a plan that addresses the existing infrastructure without having to go into a whole lot of new things and making sure things like programming is addressed and to identify potential partners for this next phase in terms of saying, all right, uh, not everything needs to be done by the, you know, Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation. You know, there are lots of other partners that, that have, you know, that are active within the area. So we can look to do that within that next phase. So this next phase is really about kind of mapping all the assets that are there, understanding kind of, you know, how we can build off of those and then coming up with a realistic kind of plan of attack at how we can address those things 
through not just the CCRDC, but through the, the myriad of partners that are there within the community. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Catherine, for your leadership and moving this forward and as well to, to Jordan and Chris. I think one of the things I'm taking away from this is that there's not really any hard surprises in the data. I think deep down in our gut, we all know some of these issues have, have occurred, but it's actually nice to be able to put some objective data from a statistically accurate sample size towards these and be able to say, yeah, these are some of the issues we've really thought about and we, we've recognized internally, but here's what we're gonna do about them. So the critical thing is the next phase that you talked about, Joe, we're gonna be not just, you know, not just collecting the data because if it sits on the shelf, it doesn't do anybody any good. Now we're gonna have to start drilling down, understand what those issues are, understand what the projects that could come out of these things are and make the recommendations as you say, it's not just about the EDC and the economic development folks, it's many partners pulling on the same rope together. So I wanna thank you for your leadership. It's very exciting for the next phase and uh, I'm gonna look forward to, to working with you all and with our various community partners on helping this uh, make these recommendations a reality.